Hello my friends and welcome to this video on AQA Physics Paper 1 for the topic of Particle Model of Matter. We're going to look at how to measure density, how, and, uh, how to define internal energy, specific heat capacity, latent heat, particle motion in gases, and pressure in gases, which is a physics only part. So for the first part of this topic we need to look at the idea of something called density. <clears throat> and density really is defined by its equation, but it's how much mass there is in a certain volume of material. So the, the letter that we use to represent density is actually rho, which is like a slightly slanted sideways p. Um, and that is equal to mass divided by volume. Mass is always measured in kilograms, and volume uh, is always measured in meters cubed. So you may have to do a calculation to work out a density of an object, make sure that you've got it in kilograms and in meters cubed. Um, and the other thing that we need to be able to do here is show a skill of how to measure the density of an object if we know it's a regular shape or if it's an irregular shape. And this is a required practical that you would have done. So for a regular shape that could be a cube or a, um, a cylinder, something like that, we need to be able to work out its volume first. Um, so for a volume for a cube, it's easy. It's the length times the width times the height. So measuring the side, length, width, height, together. So for a cuboid, easy. Um, once you've got that volume, we need to also know its mass. And to do that, you put it on some, um, some balances, hopefully with a higher resolution as possible so that it's a more accurate result for its mass. And with that, we can work out its density. And obviously to do that, mass divided by volume. Simple. But for an irregular shape, like Groot here, um, we can't measure its volume by taking measurements of length, width, height, etc., unless you're very much um, approximating. So what we would have to do is work with the idea of something called displacement. And so what we want to do is put the object in a body of water, and we want to displace the excess water when we put it in. And then displaced water is equal to the volume of our object. Um, and as a result, we can... Uh, find out the volume of that object. So we could either measure the mass of the water that's given off um, and we should know that one kilogram of water is equal to one meter cubed of water. So then we can make a direct conversion of one to the other. Makes it very easy. This is a lovely six mark question that they like to ask though and to get the six marks we have to describe how to do the calculation too. So you have to describe that once you've measured your mass and you know how much volume of the object is, um, you need to then be able to put it into the equation, state the equation and um, describe how to actually get your answer. The next part of this topic is focused on internal energy and how we can cause materials to change their state. And the internal energy is a definition you won't have seen before, before GCSE. Um, and it basically is describing a material's kinetic energy and its potential energy. And the kinetic energy, as we know, is a movement type of energy. And we can increase this by giving it more heat in a certain phase of its um, overall change in states and, and temperatures. So basically, if we're increasing the kinetic energy, something we're increasing its temperature. The potential energy, on the other hand, is based on its state. So we might have a material which has the same kinetic energy. So imagine two materials, both have the same kinetic energy, uh, but one is a gas and one is a liquid. The one that has, uh, the one that is a gas is gonna have more overall potential energy and therefore higher internal energy, even though its temperature is in effect the same. And we can explain that a little bit more looking at this graph. This is a graph that you have to interpret you won't necessarily have to draw, but you will have to be able to interpret what's happening at different parts. So if we start down here with um, our low temperature um, body of ice, for example, for water, um, if we increase the temperature here, we'd have to be applying power. So it would be transferring energy to it by heating it. Um, and we'd be heating it here the whole way through this graph, the whole way across this period of time, we're giving it the same amount of power so that's the same energy transferred every single second. And for this first phase, you can see we're putting in energy and it's increasing at a gradual rate, causing its temperature to increase. And in this phase, we're applying a rule which we'll look at in a moment called specific heat capacity, where we're putting in energy and it's raising this body of materials temperature by a certain amount of degrees. But when it gets to this dashed red line, you notice that the, the temperature stops rising but we're still putting in the same amount of power, we're still heating it by the same amount. 
You say, why is this temperature not going up? Well, that's because the energy is no longer going into its kinetic energy. It's now going into the changing the potential energy that it has. So the energy is still being absorbed by this material, but it's increasing its potential energy store instead. So it's changing its state. And for this period of time, its temperature does not increase. And this is where we apply the rule of latent heat. So its temperature is no longer changing, the energy is going into changing its state. So we had a solid. After this phase, we'll have all of it being a liquid. And this here is a latent heat of fusion that we're focusing on. So it's changing from a solid into a liquid or backwards. Once we've all got, got all of it into liquid, the energy instead will go into to raising its kinetic energy. So no longer breaking into molecular forces is now causing it to move molecules more. Those molecules will absorb this energy, causing them to move right around with a greater velocity. Until we get again to this, this period of changing states, so now we're going to be changing into a gas, and this again is where we apply latent heat law or rule. So here we have latent heat of vaporization. And in this phase, again, the energy is going into breaking the intermolecular forces. So not bonds that exist in these molecules, so bonds between um, an, a hydrogen and an oxygen, but it's breaking the intermolecular forces. The energy is becoming so great in the kinetic energy of these molecules that they no longer can stay remaining together. Um, they break free from each other, if you like. And so in a gas, they are able to move around freely, independently of each other, um, in random direction and a, a random velocity. But overall, the kinetic energy would be much higher as a gas on average than it would be as a liquid. And once we get through to this next phase, so we've increased our potential energy in this, this little window, it's turned into a gas. Again, we're putting in the same power every single second that passes by along this period of time. Um, we're putting in the same amount of energy and the temperature starts rising again in this gaseous phase. And so that gas will just increase in temperature because the molecules are moving around with more energy than they had before. But if we look at this part here, just as it turns into a gas and just as it turned into uh, turned from a liquid, those are pretty much the same temperature, so they'd have pretty much the same kinetic energy. Um, however, they'd have different potential energies because of the state that they are in. So the gas would have a much higher potential energy than the liquid would. So overall, its internal energy would be much higher because it's gained this much more energy. Uh, the energy has been transferred over this period of time due to it getting the same amount of power. So let's look into the specific heat capacity some more. So you looked at this as part of the energy topic. Uh, you went into it in quite a lot of detail. If you want to see my video on that, it's back in the energy video. There's quite a bit of information about the practical and things like that. But for this topic, what we need to know is that the energy being input over a period of time increases the temperature. It's that phase where the temperature is increasing as we're putting in energy. Now, that is basically explained in the equation that we've looked at again in energy topic. So we've got uh, here, the change of an energy of a system is dependent on the mass in kilograms, its specific heat capacity, and the change in temperature. Um, we could rearrange this to find out what the change in temperature might be for that graph that we were looking at earlier. So delta theta, meaning change in temperature, that's what that triangle means, change. The theta is a change in temperature. So here we'd have the uh, change in energy is divided by mass times the specific heat capacity of the item, the object material. Um, and we can find out how much it would change in temperature. But basically, it's an interaction between the mass, the specific capacity of the material, depending on what it is. It will absorb energy and affect the temperature in a different way um, to other materials, and the amount of energy that we're putting in. Latent heat, on the other hand, you haven't seen in the energy topic. Um, but this, as we said earlier with the graph, is the energy needed to change a material state. So in the definition, it's the energy needed for one kilogram of a substance to change state. Now, this is where we're changing the potential energy, not the temperature or the kinetic energy. It's just changing that state about it. There is an equation that we need to use here. Uh, it's one that we're given. It's on our equation sheet. Um, and it's to work out the amount of energy that we need to change a material state. We need to know how much of it we have in kilograms, its mass. And we need to know the material's specific latent heat, uh, which is similar to the specific heat capacity. But this case is how much um, specific latent heat, not specific heat capacity, uh, it's how much energy we need to put in to change its state. Now, for each material, there'll be two different types of latent heat. There'll be the specific latent heat of fusion, 
and there'll be the specific latent heat of vaporization. Um, so for fusion, it's the uh, changing of state from a solid to a liquid, and vaporization is to producing the, the vapor, it's from a liquid to a gas. Um, those two values tend to be very different, uh, so it's important that we recognize that they are different. But the equation that you use is just the same. So you may well be given uh, an example of a material, how much you have of it in its mass, and the specific latent heat of vaporization, for example, how much energy has to be put in um, is to change its state is what you need to then calculate. So now we talked about what internal energy is, let's explore the kinetic part of its internal energy a bit more. So every single molecule, especially in a gas, um, is able to, to move. Now, in a solid and a liquid, they are a little bit more fixed. A solid one, they're vibrating around a fixed position. In a liquid, they're able to flow, but they aren't able to move completely freely of all the other molecules around them. But in a gas, they are. And so when they're in a gas, we say that they move in a random direction and a random speed. Now, that random speed is dictated by because of the collisions that it has with other molecules. So if one collides with another, it's going to then fire off, uh, rebound with a specific velocity, but overall we can't predict what it's going to be. If we're looking at a fixed image, we could not say what their velocities or the direction they're travelling in is. So we say that it's random. So their motion is random. Random direction, random velocity. Um, but overall, the velocity that they travel with is dependent on their temperature. So if you looked at this whole container of molecules, their velocity wouldn't be random. It would be based on um, would be based on the temperature that they are existing in. So the average kinetic energy would be dictated by their, by their temperature because the kinetic energy is how fast they're moving. Therefore, the temperature is going to directly affect it. So temperature is related to the average kinetic energy of the molecules. If we increase the temperature, they're going to have more kinetic energy. If we're heating them up, giving them more kinetic energy, the temperature increases because heat and temperature are not the same th thing. Heat is energy, temperature is how much kinetic energy uh, these things have, how fast they're moving around. Now, temperature and pressure is a relation that you do need to be aware of here. Um, and if you imagine this is a container of gas that we were going to compress, what we're going to, in effect, do is apply a force to the edge of this container. And by doing so, if you increase the, temp in increase the pressure or increase the temperature of a, a vessel, you're increasing the pressure that's going to be felt they're basically directly correlated to each other. The final little thing we need to consider here with these movement of gases is this, this was a fixed container. Um, so we kept the volume constant within this container. Then we, if we heated them up, what we'd actually have is these particles moving around faster with more energy. So with more kinetic energy, they'd move faster. And so they'd collide with the edge so we're talking about collisions all the time here, really, for pressure, is the collisions with the edge of the box would be more frequent and with more force as they're moving faster. And so if we increase the temperature, we're going to increase the force. And if we increase the force, we're going to increase the pressure. So pressure and temperature are very much related. If we're heating up this container, these particles are going to be moving faster. So they're going to collide with the edge of the box more and with more force, and if they're colliding with more force, there's more pressure. But that is only if it's in a fixed volume. If we're not in a fixed volume, something like a balloon, that balloon would be able to expand with the increase in temperature, and so the pressure actually wouldn't change, um, and depending on the elasticity of the chamber itself, of course. Um, but if this is a fixed volume, increase in temperature leads to an increase in pressure. If you flip that around the other way, if you increase the pressure, so you're actually um, adding more particles in there, you would also increase the temperature. So let's expand this a little bit more, explore this a little bit more. This is a physics only consideration, just the extension beyond what we just talked about. Um, but gas, we know, can be compressed and expanded. So this is the stretch to not having a fixed volume, but looking at how if you change the volume of that container, what's going to happen. So pressure is a definition producing a net for is where we're producing a net force at a right angle to the wall of the gas container. So if you imagine the wall of your container, the particles are hitting it at a right angle to it. That force at the right angle to the wall creates pressure. 
Now you'll look in the second paper of physics, the definition of pressure, it's force divided by area. So it is dependent on the area of space that things are colliding with and the amount of force that they're colliding with. We're more worried about just this force part at the moment. Now we've already said that if we're heating this up and we're giving it more temperature inside, it's gonna create more force on the wall of the chamber and therefore more pressure. Well, what happens if we increase the force on the edge of the container, therefore increasing the force on the particles inside? Well, exactly the same will happen. It's just in the reverse. So if we're going to create more force, for example, by um, using a bike pump to increase the, f by putting force in ourselves on the edge of the container here, what we're actually going to do is put in more kinetic energy by creating more collision force. And by having more collision force on the edge of this container, we're going to increase the pressure. So we're actually doing work because we're applying a force to the gases. And by applying the force to the gases, we're causing them to move a certain distance. And by causing them to move a certain distance because of this equation, W equals Fs, that's what we need to know from the energy topic, um, we are causing, creating um, more pressure. So more energy input gives more internal energy, so the energy input comes from the, the force that we're actually doing. More internal energy, therefore, in the kinetic energy of the molecules, they have more collision force at the edge of the wall, it gives more pressure. So the energy input can be work done, just a little reminder, if we're getting more work done in, we're getting a higher temperature out. The final thing to think about here is the relationship between volume and pressure. Um, and this is assuming that temperature is remaining the same. So if you had a, a chamber which was small and we increased its volume, you've got to think about what's going to happen to the pressure inside it. Well, if the number of particles are going to remain the same and they're not going to make them move any faster or slower, they're going to be colliding less with the wall on the outside. So if there's an increase in the volume, so volume has got bigger, um, the pressure is going to get smaller. And this actually links to an equation that we get given, which is this one here at the top right, uh, PV equals constant, which tells us that when we multiply the volume of the vessel by its pressure, that is equal to um, a constant value. So if we multiply the, the two values here we had at the start, and we multiply the two values that we had at the end, the result of both of those would be exactly the same. You could almost say V1, P1 equals V2, P2. So the, the pressure times by the volume before is equal to the volume times of the pressure afterwards. And that is it for our little topic of particle model of matter. If you have any questions, any queries, do put a little comment underneath, but otherwise like and subscribe and check out my other revision videos for this paper.